When I was a little girl, one of my three biggest dreams was to be president of the United States of America. And when I was five years old, I wasn't worried about whether voters would be ready for a woman president whenever it was my turn to run. Fast forward to 2019, here's a headline from ABC News. Majority of voters ready for woman president, but don't think everyone is. The majority of voters polled by leanin.org were ready for a woman president, but even those who rated themselves as extremely ready thought only 5% of other people were extremely ready. So basically, most people are cool with a woman president, yet still incorrectly assume everyone else isn't. In 2019, can we talk about how insane this is? Because while the United States seems trapped in some weird sexist time warp, more than 70 other countries have had women heads of state. And research shows that countries and companies thrive with more women in leadership roles. Here's the thing about change, too. It's coming, whether you're ready or not. And ready or not, I believe women will lead the way in the 21st century. The Dalai Lama once said, the world will be saved by the Western woman now, I wouldn't limit that to just Western women, but I agree with him that the leadership of women may just be what saves civilization. Let's face it, there are some serious challenges right here on planet Earth, as Matt McGrath reported for BBC News. Do you remember the good old days when we had 12 years to save the planet? Make that 18 months. To keep the rise in global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius this century, carbon dioxide emissions need to be cut nearly in half by 2030. But many governments still need to put those policies in place, and that may need to happen by the end of 2020. We are in a climate crisis. The status quo is not working. We can't keep doing what we've been doing. We need radical change. And if you look around to see who's taking bold action now to save the planet, watch the women. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern committed to making New Zealand a zero carbon emissions country by 2050. That's historic. It's exactly the leadership the world needs right now. In breaking news this past week, women in charge of countries around the world decided that the quality of their citizens' lives is as important as the GDP. The Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdatter, she has united with the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon of Scotland, and with Jacinda Ardern, they have an agenda that is a well-being agenda that is focused on well-being of their citizens and inclusive growth. Imagine caring about health, wellness, families, the environment, and not just the stock market. So I'm here to ask that we make a quantum leap in leadership because the future of the planet may depend upon both how willing we as women are to step into more leadership roles and how willing men are to adjust to that global shift. It's time to get over outdated ideas of leadership now before the planet burns. As 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg said to world leaders at the United Nations, the eyes of all future generations are upon you. I would argue that while the past 100 years have been a time of exponential growth for women's rights, the 21st century will truly be the century of women. I was born in 1971, and so much has changed in the past century for women, it's hard to imagine living as a woman a century ago. Forget not having a cell phone or laptop, women didn't have most of the rights we take for granted today. It was just 100 years ago that the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution guaranteed women the right to vote, but really, only white women, because the Voting Rights Act forbidding racial discrimination at the polls became law in 1965. It was in the decade before I was born that women were granted the right to open a bank account on their own. In 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by Congress, Congress forbidding discrimination on the basis of sex. But it still, today, has not been ratified by the required 38 states. Just one more state to go until women have equal rights in the US Constitution. Still, I stand before you today as a business owner, a homeowner, a woman who has traveled to 30 countries on four continents, who helped another woman win the, pre the uh, popular vote in the 2016 presidential election. <laughs> so there I am as part of her, her staff. Um, but none of this would have been possible without the people who came before me and fought for our rights to own businesses, own properties, and to vote. Part of my life's quest is to pay this forward by helping other women heal from trauma and step into their full power.
As a sexual assault survivor, I spent many years healing from symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which for me manifested as chronic anxiety, panic attacks, and suicidal depression. I was drugged and raped at a New Year's Eve party when I was 20 years old. My rapist left me outside, unconscious, in sub-zero temperatures. I'm lucky I survived. When I was 22 years old, I had a stalker on campus who used to describe how he planned to murder me. I lived in a state of terror for months until one of my best friends from back home died suddenly. The kindest man I had ever known, my friend Eric, was gone, and I decided I wasn't going to wait around anymore for my stalker to kill me. Eric was the one who had noticed I was missing from that New Year's Eve party two years earlier. He came outside to find me and carried me inside after I was raped. He probably saved my life. I moved back home. The trauma overwhelmed me, and I spiraled into a PTSD-triggered depression. When I was 24 years old, I tried to take my own life. That was half a lifetime ago. And 24 years later, I can honestly say I believe anyone can rise up, no matter what traumas you may have endured. You are so much more powerful than you can even imagine. And I believe I survived so I could dedicate my life to empowering girls and women globally. And I do this work now as a women's leadership coach, public speaker, and writer. And I can tell you, when it comes to achieving equality, the world still has a long way to go. About one in eight heads of state are women. About one out of four representatives in Congress are women, and that's after the 2018 elections. Before that, we were ranked in the bottom half of the world. It's even worse in corporations. Did you know there are more male CEOs named John than there are female CEOs? <laughs> yeah, of all the Fortune 500 company CEOs today, only one is a woman of color. Not 1%, one woman. There's also a dramatic pay gap especially for women of color. Black women are the most educated demographic in the US today, yet still earn only 61 cents on the dollar compared to white men. Latina women earn 54 cents versus white men. Perhaps most shockingly, in the US today, femicide is on the rise. The average used to be that three women a day were killed by their intimate partners in the US. That number has risen to four women a day. That's 1,460 women a year, sisters, daughters, mothers, friends, gone. Gun ownership plays a role in this because a woman is five times more likely to be killed by her partner if there is a gun in, this, in the home. And our country has more guns than people. So the challenges we face as women and as a nation are daunting. And it makes sense to ask, does it really make a difference when women lead and there are more women in power? Archbishop Desmond Tutu once said, the world would be a peaceful place if it were ruled by women. Actually, it is very straightforward. Let women take over. Sounds good, right? Mm -hmm. Coming from a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but more importantly, the global research backs this up. The National Democratic Institute has reported that when women share decision-making power with men at meaningful levels, countries experience a higher standard of living, more stability, more economic development, better education and healthcare, increased cooperation between parties, and in conflict zones, more sustainable peace. A study in the Harvard Business Review showed that women in corporate leadership roles get better reviews on their leadership skills than their male colleagues. In the past decade, the average female legislator has had more of her bills made into law and secured more funding for her district than the men. Sounds like we need more women in charge, right? Even neuroscience backs this up. Dr. Daniel Amen, who wrote the book, Unleash the Power of the Female Brain, argues that the female brain is wired for leadership. He identified five key strengths of women that make us effective leaders. Collaboration, self-control, appropriate worry, empathy, and intuition. Now, I know the idea of the gendered brain can be controversial because the adult brain can be shaped by environmental factors too, not just genetics. But I'm a neuroscience nerd and I was fascinated to learn more about the differences between adult men's and women's brains. A 2017 study of more than 46,000 brain imaging scans show that women's brains are more active, especially in the prefrontal cortex, which is the CEO of the brain responsible for future planning, strategic decision-making, and moderating social behavior. The prefrontal cortex is also larger and matures faster in women than men. On the flip side, the amygdala, which is the fear center or reptilian brain, is larger in men. 
neuroscientists report that men are generally more violent, aggressive, and impulsive than women. So whether it's due to genetics or the way we were raised, the typical woman has a brain that's wired to stay calm and continue to problem solve. Isn't that what we want from our world leaders? The auditory cortex, where learning and language centers are located, and hippocampus, or memory center, are larger in women. The influence of estrogen on the brain helps women better recognize faces and emotionally connect. We are typically raised as nurturers and tend to cultivate empathy. All of this means that women can make masterful negotiators, harnessing the power of language, memory, and human connection. And frankly, a leader who lacks empathy is dangerous. So, uh, <clears throat> all of this, of course, is not to say that men should not lead. Only that women may, in fact, be uniquely qualified to lead. A lot of great men have helped shape history. One great man saved my life. But to save the planet now, we all need to focus on strategic decision making, minimize reckless risks, and choose empathy for others. And, and don't worry, women don't want to conquer the world. We just want to save it. And we want equality. We want basic human rights. We want equal wages for equal work. We want bodily autonomy. We want men to stop raping and killing us. And yes, we want a seat at the table in the halls of power. We are going to take a stand because it's time. The planet is running out of time. So what do we need to do to make that happen? Let's talk problems and solutions. We've covered wage gap, inequality stats, violence against women. Most women are familiar with the confidence gap. The self-esteem of most girls starts to plummet by around age eight. Luckily, things level out after around age 40, but for a few decades in between. <laughs> I'm over 40, by the way, so yeah. Most, most, uh, most men are more blazingly confident than most women. Oh. Then there's the likability factor. This is from leanin.org. When a man is successful, people often like him more. When a woman is successful, people often like her less. Women candidates are expected to be both qualified and likable. Men just have to be seen as qualified. Sometimes not even. <laughs> so <laughs> that the beauty industry is weaponized. A study by One Poll for Groupon showed that the amount of money the average woman spends on her appearance in her lifetime could pay for four years of college tuition. The beauty industry can also be physically harmful to women, especially women of color, who are applying more and more toxic products to their bodies than white women, as reported by Ankita Rao and Vice Magazine. A 2017 study by Zota and Shama Sunder about the global beauty industry showed that the mass distribution of images that idealize whiteness have increased sales of skin lighteners and hair straighteners. These are much more likely to be toxic than other beauty products, exposing women to harmful chemicals that can cause cancer or affect women's reproductive cycles. And we haven't even touched on the $72 billion U.S. diet industry or the 7 million women in this country suffering from eating disorders. As a woman, loving the body you are in is a radical act and one that we all must practice because starving ourselves in the world's wealthiest nation is its own form of madness. Despite all of these challenges, however, women still have the power to shape the future and fate of this nation and likely this world. And we have strength in numbers. That gives us power. Women greatly outnumber men in the number of registered voters in the U.S. by about 10 million votes. If all women got out there and voted in every election, we could likely determine the outcome of every single election. So how else do we shift and change things now? Number one. I believe we need to unify around some common goals worth fighting for. My mission is empowering girls and women globally, and I invite you to join me on this mission. I hope we can all agree that we need to prioritize saving this planet for future generations. We're all still fighting for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, to live in a nation in which people are judged by the content of their character, not their skin color. Number two. Spread the idea that women are here to lead. Seriously, share this TED Talk, share the statistics. When someone says to you, women are too emotional to lead, blast them with some facts. <laughs> 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 you 
Number three, as my mentor, Susan Hyatt, author of the best-selling book Bear, likes to say, focus on the wage gap, not the thigh gap. This is easier said than done in a society that teaches girls our value is in our looks. That's a lie. We must focus more energy and money on our careers and our education and less trying to achieve some false ideal of female beauty. Number four, use your voice and your vote. If there's nothing else you take away from this talk, remember that if all women voted, we would likely determine the outcome of every single election. Speak out, call your legislators, or run for office yourself. Madam President might be watching this talk. We are waiting for you. <laughs> Number six, choose intersectional feminism. To be a true feminist means to stand up for all women. White women, especially, have a responsibility to use our privilege to fight for the rights of women of color and cisgender, heterosexual women for the rights of our LGBTQIA sisters. And finally, number seven, we need help from our male allies. Men, please be like Benedict Cumberbatch and protest the pay gap. Speak out against rape culture. Campaign and vote for women. Because when we all lift each other up, together, there is nothing we cannot do. For the women and girls watching this talk, never forget how powerful you are. You already have what it takes to lead, and the world needs your gifts. For the men and boys, please keep listening and learning from the powerful women around you. Remember that more women leaders means a better world for everyone. And to resist progress now is a threat to our existence as a planet and a species. If, if you've been wondering, by the way, about my other two biggest childhood dreams, <laughs> besides being president, um, I've lived them. One was to be a professional dancer, and I taught and performed Lindy Hop for five years. <laughs> the other was to be a best-selling author, which hasn't happened yet, but I'm writing a book now, so watch out, world. <laughs> and I urge you to do the work you feel called to do in this world. Don't be afraid to lead the way. Be like Greta, because most people who create positive change do it whether or not people are ready. There'll probably be someone who'll tell you it's not your time or your place. Do it anyways. Even you may not feel 100% ready, but the world needs your voice and your gifts. And if you've been waiting for a sign from the universe to make the leap, this is it. There's your sign. <laughs> make that leap. I'm not quite done. One more thing, sorry. <laughs> it would be a good ending, but I went one more thing, sorry. <laughs> but you do need to make the leap. So I'll close with a favorite quote by the author Richard Bach. Here is a test for whether or not your mission on Earth is finished. If you are alive, it isn't. I am so thankful that I am still alive. You are alive. Embrace your mission and trust me, you'll be too busy saving the planet to worry about whether or not people find you likable. Thank you. Thank you.